verse 57 of chapter 26. Then I'll pray and then we'll, we'll, we'll um, crack on. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now, the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that, none might, uh, that, that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. Jesus said to him, you've said so, but I tell you from now on, you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do you need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, he deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him. And some slapped him saying, prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? Now, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus, the Galilean. He denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl said to him, uh, saw him and said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up, to Peter, uh, up and said to Peter, certainly you too are one of them for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the cock crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest, taking the pieces of silver, said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury since it is blood money. So, they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. That was the fulfillment uh, that then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but this is God's word which lasts forever. Let's pray. Our loving Father God, we uh, sit under your words week by week. Uh, sometimes it is familiar to us and easy to hear. Sometimes it is familiar to us and hard to hear. Father, help us to slow down and to hear your voice as you speak to us through your word this morning. Help us to be gentle with one another. Help us to be uh, uh, brought closer to rely more dearly on Christ as we read and we understand what you've put in your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, in, the, in the TV show, um, The, the Marvellous Mrs. Maisel, one of the um, kind of themes that comes up several times uh, through the, the series um, is what happens when you come face to face with the real person. So people have two faces. They have a face that they put out to the world uh, and a face uh, that, that you see in private. Um, 
Uh, and, and the theme is, what do people think when they meet the real person? So there's the, the confident American music hall comedian, uh, who in reality is something of an aristocratic snob. Uh, there is uh, a world-famous crooner, uh, who's always surrounded by an entourage, and then in private, he's insecure and lonely. Uh, there's a, a foul-mouthed agent who's always swearing at people, uh, but in reality, she's loyal and caring. There's a 50s housewife um, who has all of the kind of trappings of being a 50s housewife, but in reality is a, um, a talented performer. There's a, a maths professor who's very straight-laced, who in reality is something of a, a socialist campaigner. Uh, th there's something interesting in the, that we enjoy in seeing the difference between people, what people think someone's like and what they're really like. But what the series actually explores is how do people react when they're faced uh, with the truth? What is the reaction when you meet the true person? Um, there, there's lots of evidence that um, when an interviewer reads a CV, you have somewhere between five and 30 seconds before they decide what you are, who you are. Uh, they, they won't look at more than the first um, five to 30 seconds. Um, as an experiment, um, the, the company I worked for, we, uh, I was employee number two. Uh, when we first hired someone who none of the people at the company knew, uh, we decided the final stage of the interview process, we would um, have someone on a full-time paid contract for at least two weeks so they could see what we were really like. Um, so part of the, the interview process wasn't just, uh, can you answer the competency questions we put in front of you? But if we pay you a salary and you sit with us and see how crazy we really are day to day, do you still want to work with us and vice versa? We wanted them to see what it was like to be with us as real people. And we wanted to see how they reacted to that. Um, the end of that story is that the person actually stayed for three years. Um, so it's their own fault. They got stuck with us. Um, the interesting thing is not necessarily who the real person is. That is interesting, and we'll come back to that. But how other people react when they're exposed to reality. When people see who the real person is, what is their reaction? That is the, the theme of these three episodes uh, in Matthew's Gospel. We're moving to the end of Jesus' uh, life on earth. We're moving to uh, Good Friday and to Easter Sunday. Um, and what we see is, is how people react when they understand who Jesus really is. Not just a kind of a, a perception or a, an image that they've built up. Not just when people say, I've always thought that Jesus is X. He's all about Y. But the real reality. Uh, the, the three episodes uh, that are moving us to the, the end game of Jesus' ministry uh, they each have something to show about how we naturally, you and I, uh, react when we're faced with who Jesus really is. It's about how sinners, people who ultimately don't want God to be in charge, people like you and I, react when we understand how Jesus, who Jesus truly is. And the picture is not pretty. Um, there, there's three incidents. There's the, the trial, the denial, and the tragedy. And we're going to look at each of them in turn. Um, and see what Matthew has to tell us about what it looks like when people react uh, to the real Jesus. So the first episode, uh, the first episode is the trial. It centers on uh, the religious leaders, particularly on Caiaphas, who's the high priest. Uh, and the big truth from the first episode is, is that religion teaches sinners to react with outrage when, when we meet the real Jesus. Religion teaches sinners to react with outrage when we meet the real Jesus. Uh, the, the people who have been sent to arrest Jesus, they, they take him not to the civil authorities, not to uh, the Roman leader at first, but instead to the people who've commissioned them, uh, to the ones who have already decided they want Jesus out of the picture. And center stage amongst this meeting is Caiaphas, the high priest. Uh, we learn a bit more about Caiaphas in some of the other gospels, in John's gospel in particular. Uh, and there he, he shows that he's acting out of some uh, misguided attempt to protect the Jewish people from their invaders from Rome. Uh, but in this account, that's, that's not the, uh, the main focus of what Matthew's telling us. We see something else about Caiaphas in these verses. He's, he's a leader of a deceptive cabal who, who want to fabricate a miscarriage of justice, who want to create a legal fiction. Uh, Caiaphas's prosecution team are commissioned to dig up witnesses 
witnesses who uh, are not going to be telling the truth, but are going to, be, going to be credible enough in their lies that they can give Jesus the death sentence. That's what, that's what we read uh, in the first few verses, uh, that um, they, they were seeking false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. That was their aim. They were digging up these witnesses who would be telling lies that would enable them to get the death sentence against Jesus, uh, but they need to be credible. Um, and at first, uh, they, um, they struggle with that. Uh, but Matthew wants us to realise that these leaders are not interested in what's true. They're not interested in uh, getting to the root of the matter. They're more interested in getting the outcome they've already decided. They're, they're willing to, to break the ninth commandment. We read the, the Ten Commandments earlier on. Uh, very explicitly, Matthew says, they are breaking the ninth commandment uh, to get what they want. And so they spend uh, the, the first part of the day uh, interviewing uh, sham witnesses. Uh, none of them uh, at first are compelling enough to get them what they want. Uh, and then eventually they come across two men who are willing to report something that Jesus has said. Uh, what they report is actually quite similar to something Jesus really did say. Um, so again, um, uh, in John's Gospel, we, we see an incident where Jesus says something quite similar. Uh, Jesus has cleared out the temple of those who were uh, using it for their own financial gain. He's asked where his authority comes to do that. And he responds with quite a similar statement to what they report here. Tear down this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. John makes it clear that in that account, uh, the um, that Jesus was pointing to his own death and resurrection. Uh, obviously, that context is left out of the witness statements here. Um, and these crooked witnesses, they, they, they file their affidavits. Uh, they change the phrasing subtly of what Jesus says. They say that what Jesus was saying was, I'm the one with the power to tear the temple down. The, kind of the, the emphasis lands on, I'm going to tear it down, rather than, if you tear it down, I'll be able to build it up again in three days. Uh, they, they leave out the context that he was challenging those questioning him in the temple. Um, and, and they leave out the fact that Jesus was saying, if you tear it down, I will build it up again. And Caiaphas turns to Jesus, asks him what he has to say to whatever the accusation is. And Jesus doesn't even dignify this statement with a response. So the high priest then pivots. He pivots to the core of what he is concerned about. He's not trying to um, catch Jesus with a false accusation anymore, he gets to the heart of what his problem is. He hates Jesus because of who Jesus claims to be. Religious people don't, don't have a problem with benign teachers and philosophers. Leaders who love religion don't worry about a, a quiet monk or nun. Leaders who love religion don't concern themselves with those who are good at teaching the religious education curriculum. They don't even hate Jesus' teaching per se, so long as they can pass him off as irrelevant. Leaders who love religion hate the authority that Jesus claims. They hate who he is claiming to be. Caiaphas uh, puts Jesus under oath. That's what he means when he says, I adjure you. Are you God's sent rescuer? Are you the Christ? Are you the one chosen by God? Are you God himself? Who are you saying you are? And Jesus' answer is what seals his fate, humanly speaking. He acknowledges what Caiaphas has said in his response, and then he builds on it. He says, that's, that's not all. What you said, yes, it's, it's true. But even more than that, I will be totally visible to the whole world as being equal to God in authority. I will have all the markers that you've come to expect of God himself coming. I am equal with God. He's saying he's the son of man, he's totally uh, human, and he's acknowledging what has been said about him, that he is equal to God. He is the son of man, he is the son of God, he is God's Christ the one who's been sent to rescue God's people. That is his statement at the heart of this trial. And that is the heart of the problem that Caiaphas and people who are taught by religion kick against. 
Jesus, who has the right to demand our obedience because he has the entire authority of heaven, is uh, putting under threat all the manufactured authority that religion brings. The, the leaders have heard enough. The crime that, um, that he's charged with at this point is blasphemy. He puts God's voice and name and reputation on his own lips, and so the sentence is death. And at once, as soon as that is pronounced, that the religious leaders begin to treat him as subhuman. He's good for nothing in their eyes now, other than to be mocked. He deserves violence because he's, he's not worth enough to be concerned about his well-being. That's why they treat him the way that, he, that they do. They're treating him to say, you are no longer worth life. He has once, uh, at once become less than human by claiming to be one with God. It's, it's a very religiously taught response. They are outraged because of who Jesus says he really is. He's not the Christ that they want. It is not someone who fits into their comfortable hierarchy. Um, young people, you probably heard that, you probably know the song, Jesus is the King. Uh, the chorus goes, Jesus is the King, ruler over everything. Jesus is the one, the promised one, the Son of God. Jesus is the Lord. He's the one you can't ignore. Jesus, he is the King. That is who Caiaphas has been faced with. Jesus, the King, the one that they cannot ignore. And it makes them mad. They are outraged. Sinners faced with who Jesus really is get mad. At a distance, in a box, drawn in our own pencil, Jesus is tolerable. But make no mistake, up close, Jesus the King threatens our mastery of our own universe. Jesus' trial shows that sinners confronted with Jesus may dress up our reaction in religious clothes, but what we experience is outrage at who he really is. And so we go on to the second episode, uh, the denial. And in this, uh, this episode, we, we see the second big truth, that culture, the world around us, teaches us to put distance between ourselves and Jesus. Culture teaches us to put distance between ourselves and the real Jesus. We've been told that uh, by Matthew at the start of the passage uh, that Peter followed at a distance. He was just about close enough to see what was happening, uh, to see uh, what was going to come to fulfillment. That, that's the word that Matthew uses. What was the fulfillment of what had been started? He wasn't quite close enough to get into trouble, but he wanted to see what was happening. And at this point, um, he ends up in the courtyard uh, with the kind of entourage of Caiaphas's um, uh, uh, cabal, with the guards and the, the servants and the hangers-on. Um, he doesn't know what's going on inside the building. He doesn't have the kind of uh, the live feed going on. Uh, but out in the courtyard where he is, there's a collection of people who, who understand who's inside the building. Uh, they, uh, they know who's been brought up in, in the police car. They know what's likely to happen and what's going to uh, uh, be the outcome, probably. There are people who associate with the, high pr the chief priest um, and the other religious leaders, so they know how they're likely to react to this Jesus. Peter wants to know where things will end up, uh, but, he, uh, uh, but to the people who are warming themselves out in the courtyards, Peter sticks out. There's, there's three exchanges uh, in these verses from 69 through to 75. Um, the first one is, is one-to-one between Peter and a servant. Uh, the second one is, is public, but it's not actually Peter that's involved. He's watching as a second servant speaks to the crowd. And then the third one is, is the crowd who've been spoken to turn around and speak to Peter. Uh, and the question at hand is, who are you with? Who do you associate with? We all know, say the crowd, what's going on inside this building. We know who's been brought in through, uh, uh, through under the in the police car. We know what's likely to happen to him. So are you with him? It's obviously uncomfortable for Peter. He knows what it's going to cost to follow Jesus, at least in his head. Until this moment, he maybe didn't appreciate what it was actually going to be like. So back in chapter 16 of, of Matthew's gospel, uh, Peter had boldly stated that, that Jesus shouldn't go to Jerusalem because he was going to end up in precisely the situation he's in right now. And uh, at that point, Jesus left Peter in no uncertain terms that it was totally necessary for him to go. He knew where, where he was going, Jesus did, uh, and he knew it was necessary 
And then he went on to use a phrase to describe to Peter what it would mean to associate with him. He said, my followers will need to pick up their cross and follow me. Uh, we, we hear that phrase and we think of it as quite kind of uh, pictorial, quite philosophical. Life is going to be a little bit tough for us. But for Peter, he's realizing the real reality of that statement. If he associates with the man inside the building, he will probably share what happens when he leaves the building. And so under pressure from those around him, he at first eases and then sprints away from Jesus. In the first exchange uh, with the servant girl, one-to-one, he, he tries to soften, he tries to redirect, he tries to move the conversation away from where he can see it going. Uh, he, he doesn't outright at first say, I, I don't know Jesus. He, he just kind of says, I, I don't really understand what you're asking me. I'm not really sure where this is going. Peter's sort of, sort of hoping that they'll think that he's just hanging out with them by chance, that he just ended up there, uh, and that what's going on inside the building has nothing to do with him. Because he knows the seriousness of the consequence of associating with Jesus, and so he pretends not to grasp what the servant accuses him of. But fairly quickly, that private equivocation, the waffle, escalates into someone pressing the point. Uh, he begins to, Peter begins to walk away. He moves towards the entrance. He's trying to leave. Uh, and, and he wants to get out of this kind of culture that is trying to pin him to Jesus. And at that point, a second servant uh, picks up the question in front of the crowd. Uh, this time, it's not a one-to-one -one conversation. She doesn't speak to Peter directly, uh, but she speaks to the crowd about Peter, who's, who's meandering out of the door. He's had his chance to admit his fault, to own up, to repent of his association with the criminal inside, the one who's so offensive to the masters, he's not going to be allowed to slip quietly away and hide his relationship with persona non grata. The, the second servant puts in front of the crowd that he is one of them. And so Peter is backed into a corner. Uh, he actually has to come out and own up to his confederacy with this criminal. And he clearly states at this point, I don't know Jesus. I'm just an innocent bystander. Whatever's going on in there is something I don't have any part of. I know you don't like him. I know he's a criminal in your eyes. I know who you're talking about, although I said I didn't. I don't have any part in him. I don't know him. Not just I don't know who he is. I don't associate with him. He's not part of me. I'm not part of him. He wants to be part of a conversation. Um, he, he can see it unfolding. He's not the one that's being addressed initially, but he kind of inserts himself into the, the servant girl in the crowd talking. He's not technically part of, of it, but he can see where it's going. Uh, he can see where the crowd is heading. I'm far away from that person that you all hate. I'm not with him. Even if I'm from the same place, I, I don't know him. And so it goes. Uh, and then we, we get to the third conversation. Uh, Peter's directly faced by the crowd who've been told he's one of them. They, they kind of turn from the servant girl and address him instead. Uh, and they make the same challenge. And, and this time he's, he's really panicked. He's like a, a kind of a cornered possum backed into a corner. He comes out swinging. He stakes his own reputation. He makes oaths. He makes legally binding promises that he is part of the high priest entourage. I belong with that crowd. I belong with you. I don't belong with him. I'm not with him. And at once, the prediction that Jesus made earlier in chapter 26 is punctuated by the cock crowing. As soon as he says it, the cock crows, and Peter knows what he's done. Peter leaves. He cries violently, and he feels some sense of failure and remorse for what he's done. We'll come back to that uh, at the end. There's quite a different reaction here that actually eventually leads to Peter repenting and being restored to Jesus. And we see the first glimpse of that in his weeping. But for now, the culture around Peter breathes the oxygen of hating Jesus. The culture around him isn't satisfied with doing away with Jesus and forgetting about him. The culture around Peter is sniffing like a bloodhound. 
with evangelical zeal, it wants to remove anyone associated with the criminal. They didn't start the hate that came initially from the, the leaders, but they have drunk it in. It's coming through their pores. They want to punish anyone who is associated with Jesus. This is no longer just about hating Jesus. It is spread out to anyone associated with him. And for this crowd, if you are associated with Jesus, then you cannot be associated with them. That is the, that is the choice. You associate with Jesus or you associate with us. You cannot do both. There's no middle grounds, no agnostic. Peter senses that tone. Faced with the reality of who Jesus is, faced with the reality of the cost of associating with him, surrounded by a culture that takes associating with Jesus as being an enemy of themselves, he is taught to distance himself from Jesus, to step back, to move away. I'm not with him. I mean, yeah, he's a, he's a charismatic guy. His teaching's great. Healing, great. Loving people, great. Forgiveness, great. But he's a little bit hardcore. I, I'm into his love and his for, forgiveness. Uh, but, but that being equal with God, it's kind of dangerous. It makes me feel a bit uncomfortable. Don't be fooled that sinners hate who Jesus really is and hate those who associate with him. Faced with who Jesus is and what that means for our own prospects in a world that hates him, sinners are taught by the culture around to put distance between Jesus and ourselves. So that's the denial. And then we move on to the tragedy. Um, and at this point, the clock jumps forward to the, the, the following morning. What's happened inside the building has become public. It's become more visible. People begin to know that Jesus has been um, sentenced to death for blasphemy. Um, and we see a massive tragedy in this last episode. Uh, and the, kind of the big message that, that runs through it is that trying to serve Jesus at the same time as what our sin wants only gives us overwhelming despair. Trying to serve Jesus and what our sin wants at the same time will only give us overwhelming despair. Now, before I get into the, the episode itself and, and what it's here to teach us, I want to take a moment to address the, the, the tragedy of what's happening in the verses. It's, it's about a real human being. This is true history. Uh, when our kids were younger, the, the kind of phrase that we used in the house when we read the Bible is that we're going to read a true story from the Bible. It's, it's not just a, a nice story. It is a true historical story. It is about a true historical human being, this episode. Uh, and any death is tragic, and particularly, as we look at this, suicide. It's a historical event. It's a human being. It's someone who's lost all hope. It's not just an allegory. It's not just a parable. It describes a really tragic situation, and one that is not unfamiliar in our society. There's... there's a situation that many people find themselves in, far too many people, is a real and terrible problem today that uh, lots of people, and actually, in, particularly in our society, particularly young men, um, contemplate suicide, often out of despair, often out of mental health issues, often seeing it as the only lever left to pull, uh, the only control over despair. And I want to say that I'm not... Uh, intending in any sense to trivialise what happens here, to turn it into a fairy tale or a, a salutary lesson for us. The Bible is real. It is historical and deals with real difficult topics. The reality is, in many ways, this is one of those weeks where I'm both glad and frustrated at our conviction that we're going through the Bible passage by passage. Uh, I um, would, in many ways, rather not have to deal with this incident, pretend it wasn't there and that we don't know this truth about Ju Judas, about what happens to him. I would rather not have to preach it. It's raw and it's sad. And I suspect for many people here, it touches on things that uh, pastorally, historically, you find difficult. But you would all notice if we skipped these verses, if we pretended they weren't in God's word. And so we approach God's word somberly. We approach it with reverence and humility. We approach it sometimes with tears in our eyes and our hearts, knowing that God gives us, 
his word to his people for our eternal good. The Bible isn't candy canes and uh, candy floss. It, it deals with the reality of a universe that is marred by some of the worst effects of sin. And I don't know what's gone on in your history. I don't know what's happened in your past. Uh, I will say in passing that, that I do have some experience uh, in my own friendship circle, historically, of suicides. I'm not going to go into the details, but, but please don't take me dealing with this as, uh, uh, as trying to kind of turn a theological point from a real historical tragedy. Uh, it's written down for us because the Holy Spirit caused it to be written down for us. I want to handle this with gentleness, recognising it as a tender issue. Um, as always, if there's things that you want to talk about, the elders are happy to talk and pray with you. Uh, and equally, um, if you uh, are struggling with mental health issues, uh, we'd encourage you and we'll help you to get the, the medical help you need. Um, there are, are mental health conditions that, just like a broken leg, just like lymphoma, need proper professional medical care. And, and we want to help people who need that get that. In the darkest moment of despair, what we see in God's words is that no human is ever entirely without hope. Judas couldn't see that, and that is tragic. But it was true. You will not always feel that to be true. But it is true. And we'll come back to that at the end. In the darkest moment of despair, no human is ever entirely without hope. And so with that kind of pastoral diversion, um, uh, let's briefly look at the, the tragedy. Um, he's heard the verdict that Jesus um, has been convicted to death, and somehow he's surprised that that's the outcome. He realizes the impact of what he's done. He is, humanly speaking, directly responsible for Jesus uh, being sentenced to death. And he knows Jesus well enough to know that he does not deserve that. By implication, Matthew's telling us that, that Judas knows that what Jesus says about himself is true. He knows that what Jesus has said doesn't count as blasphemy because he is who he says he is. Judas was willing to lose a friendship over some money, but now he realizes that that willingness will cost Jesus his own life. He tries to, to roll back what he's done. He tries to um, reverse the contract he had. Maybe if I hand back the money, it will come untrue. He tells the leaders that, that Jesus isn't guilty, that he doesn't deserve to die. And revealingly, the leaders don't care. They don't care whether it's true or false. That's what they say. They tell him that if he feels that bad, that's his problem. He should go and make his peace with it and do what he sees fit. Judas throws the money into the temple and leaves. And ultimately, he, he kills himself. He's seen who Jesus really is. He's measured it against his own actions, his own character, and he can't live with the reality of the comparison. He is in utter despair. He's attempted to serve both what his sin wanted and Jesus to get the best of both, and he's lost all hope because Jesus is so innocent and he is so guilty. Matthew goes on to show that the leaders won't use the money um, in the temple. Uh, it's blood money, by which they mean it's money that they had used to pay for a man's life, to pay for Jesus' death, uh, and actually doubly so because it caused the untimely death of a second man. They do use it in a way, however, that fulfills an Old Testament prophecy, and that's crucial. Uh, the sadness and the tragedy of the last episode is that when sinners are faced with the real Jesus, our sin and, our ho and his holiness leave us overwhelmed with despair at how bad our sin is and how perfect God is. So what then? What are the implications? Why did the Holy Spirit record each of these three somber episodes for, uh, for his church? I think there's three main reasons uh, that I'll touch on, two quite briefly, and then one I'll dwell on a little bit more. Uh, the first reason that the Holy Spirit, I think, caused these three things to be written down for us is that they really happened. It's history. It's true. Uh, they were important parts of Jesus' final days on earth. The Gospel of Matthew is a true story from history. It actually happened, and these things actually happened. The second reason, I think, is that, that these incidents show that even in injustice, even in pain, even in suffering, even in the mess of this world, God is fulfilling promises 
God knew this was going to happen. And Jesus was in total control of what is being played out here. The injustice of how Jesus was treating is spoken about in Isaiah 53 and in other places. The trial fulfills Isaiah 53. The abandonment of Jesus by his closest friends was predicted by Jesus himself in, in the start of chapter 26 of Matthew's Gospel. Judas's betrayal fulfilled words from several prophets that God's people had heard centuries before, and particularly the one that Matthew quotes. What is happening here is history, and it fulfills prophecy. It shows that God keeps what he says, that God is in control of his universe. It is God using human history to fulfill his eternal promise to rescue his people. And it is costly to God to keep that promise. What we see is the cost to God himself of keeping his own promise. The trial, injustice, denial, abandonment, betrayal in the tragedy. It's costly to him to keep that promise, but he does it. And that leads us thirdly, crucially, to the, the third reason why, we need to, uh, why, why it's written down for us. Because by the end of these three episodes, we ought to be yearning that God would keep all of his promise, not just what he's done so far. Not just the historical build-up, not just the worst moments that cost God everything to keep his promise, but fulfillment that brings resolution to the problem of these three big reactions. Sinners faced with Jesus are taught to react with outrage by religion and to give distance between ourselves and Jesus by culture. We're taught to be overwhelmed by our own sin when we try and um, serve both sin and Christ. But those three problems, sinners who hate God, who distance ourselves from him, who are overwhelmed by our fitness to live in God's creation, are precisely the problems that the whole promise of Easter is planned to overcome. They are our problems, my problem and your problem. We're wired to only by default be able to hate Jesus, to feel the pressure of the culture and respond by stepping back from Jesus, distancing from him. At some level, know that our distance from God means that we are not fit to live in his creation. The promise of Jesus is that people who can only hate, people who are far away, people who have no hope left, no agency, no control over our destiny, are yet given a promise by God. Jesus' death and resurrection takes our hearts and gives them a new setting. We could only hate and now we can love because Jesus first loved us. His death and resurrection takes aliens and reconciles us to our creator, takes enemies and makes children of our heavenly father. Jesus' death and resurrection takes existential despair and replaces it with hope that is sure, that is certain, that lasts forever. Not a kind of a trivial hope that says, if you believe enough, you won't feel this bone deep despair, because that is both theologically and medically bad and wrong. We rightly have no hope and are right to despair without Jesus, but we are not without Jesus. By the end of these verses, we are yearning for the fulfillment of the full promise of God. And we are reassured because these are episodes that shows God fulfills what is promised. If he fulfills even these moments and what it costs Christ, we yearn for the rest of it. Hope of restoration to God, hope of forgiveness that we do not deserve. Because this passage is crucial for you and I. We see the reality of reality in it. We taste the tang of what we deserve. We see the truth of how we react when we're faced with the real Jesus. And yet unexpectedly, God fulfills his promise even in these moments that we might know he will, he will fulfill every promise. I'm going to close uh, holding out that certain hope that we have. I'm going to read um, some verses from Isaiah 53, uh, one of the prophecies I talked about earlier on, about the big exchange that is going on. This is the hope that we have. The first verses talk about what is fulfilled in what we've just read. And the last verses talk about the full fulfillment of God's promise. He, Jesus, um, who's been prophesied about, was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. 
and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. We esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. And yet he opens not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before it shears, so he opens not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he has done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, God will see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for transgressors. Let's hear those words one more time and be hopeful with certain hope. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. This is the promise of the God who is willing to go through what we saw this morning, that we might be his forever. Let's pray. Loving Father God, these are hard, true accounts. Help us to see in them the wonder of Christ. Father, help us to feel the, the tang and the sadness and the tragedy of what our sin brings into your creation. And yet give us hope that you're the God who is keeping his promises as we read these verses. The God who has fully kept all of his promises in Christ Jesus, that by his stripes we might be healed. Father, thank you for Christ. Help us to praise him today in his name. Amen.